Thank you again for joining us for today's webinar, Access to Specialty Medications and Value-Based Insurance Design. I will now turn it over to our moderator, NPC's Director of Health Services Research, Kimberly Westridge, for a few housekeeping items. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, we're thrilled that everyone could join us today for our webinar on Access to Specialty Medications and Value-Based Insurance Design. We've got a wonderful panel of speakers that are uh, joining us here today. I, I imagine that everyone on the phone is familiar with our speakers, but I am going to go through bios anyway. Uh, speaking first will be Dr. Mark Fendrick. Dr. Fendrick is a professor of internal medicine and a professor of health management and policy at the University of Michigan. He currently directs the Center for Value-Based Insurance Design at the University of Michigan and he is the leading advocate for development, implementation, and evaluation of innovative health plans. He's also a member of the University's Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation, and we're really thrilled to have Dr. Fendrick with us today. Also joining us is Dr. Will Schrank. Dr. Schrank is the Chief Scientific Officer and Chief Medical Officer of Provider Innovation and Analytics at CVS Health. Dr. Schrank focuses on the development of innovative pharmacy solutions to help improve the quality of care while lowering costs in order to help healthcare providers deliver services to distinct patient populations. Dr. Schrank oversees the company's overall research and clinical program development, and he has the goal of delivering new methods of evaluating innovative programs and initiatives. So he's very well positioned to speak today to the issues related to specialty medications and innovative designs such as value-based insurance design. Also joining us is Dr. Brian Klepper who is the CEO of the National Business Coalition on Health. Much of Dr. Klepper's work has been focused on the mechanisms that actually underlie America's health care cost crisis and institutionalized clinical and business practices. He's a columnist for the physician site Medscape, and he's also a regular contributor to the health affairs blogs. The Dr. Weighs In and Kevin MD and other expert health care blogs. Uh, Dr. Klepper is also a reviewer for Health Affairs and Journal of Ambulatory Care Management, and we're very pleased that he can join us today to represent a purchaser perspective. So what is a specialty medication? Uh, you can't pick up a newspaper today without hearing about them. They're, they're all over in the media, and you know, surprisingly, there actually isn't a standard definition of specialty medication. So when you're looking at various reports, or analyses, they're probably all using slightly different definitions of specialty medications. The common definitions that will out there will say that specialty medications consist of complex molecules, and they typically require special handling when they're being delivered, when they're being administered to patients, or some special um, watching of the patients to look for any sorts of um, interactions. So, that's part of the definition. Some definitions also include a cost threshold, the CMS threshold that's currently used is $600 a month. So those are some of the elements that you'll see in a definition, but there is no common definition of a specialty medication. They are frequently used for treating chronic, serious, life-threatening conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, and cancer. So they're very important to patients. No matter what definition is being used for specialty, people agree that the spending trend is projected to increase. We're in an era of unprecedented innovation, bringing us not only treatments, but cures. I'm going to say that again, we're actually seeing cures. So this is a pretty exciting time, but we are looking at these trends. And when we're seeing these trends, plans, of course, will start to, to scrutinize and many of them have adopted high cost sharing that they pass along to patients, this can lead to access problems and result in non-adherence and potentially poor outcomes. So that's really a concern. So what we're here to talk about today is how to pivot from thinking about how much money are we spending to how well are we spending this money. For many patients, for many of these diseases, spending a certain amount of money on specialty medications is actually one of the most thoughtful and most valuable ways that money can be spent. 
passing along indiscriminate high cost sharing to patients can actually result in access problems, non-adherence problems, which isn't in the best interest of patients. It's not in the best interest of employers. And the good news is that there are lots of thoughtful folks out there thinking about what are some solutions to ensure that patients can get access to the medications that they need and think about the types of financial incentives that we can put in place that will help encourage patients to use the right medications that have high value to them. Before I turn it over to our panelists, I do want to remind folks that are with us today and listening that the views and opinions that are expressed by the panelists during this webinar are their opinions alone. They do not necessarily reflect the views of NPC. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Mark Fendrick. Kimberly, thank you very much. And I want to thank all of you taking time out of your busy schedules to tune into this uh, webinar. It's a pleasure to be participating with my friends and colleague, Will and Brian, and uh, would very much enjoy to kick off this conversation about potential solutions to bring about uh, this twist, as Kimberly said, from how much we spend to how well we spend on healthcare, uh, which is basically our tagline at the University of Michigan Center for Value-Based Insurance Design. I just wanted to quickly let everyone know that anything you ever want to know about value-based insurance design, and particularly about value-based insurance design and its potential role in specialty pharmaceuticals can be found on our website that you see on this slide. And for those of you who are so inclined, and I thank you, Kimberly, and the NPC team uh, for putting out our Twitter handle, and you would make my dozen or so students at the VBIT Center very happy if some of you might uh, begin to follow us at, at um underscore VBID. Uh, to learn about how we're trying to bring this conversation from how much to how well. And that said, if we go to the next slide, you'll see that um, this is what we're all about, uh, trying to remind people that uh, we are in the healthcare business to produce health, uh, yet regardless, uh, everywhere I go to talk about stakeholders from across the board of the entire spectrum of people interested in healthcare, from management and labor and Republicans and Democrats, I think the principal focus is uh, how much we're spending, percent of GDP, uh, how the rate of growth is going, and uh, it is uh, important for us to remind these stakeholders that if you look at the highest value clinical services, no matter where you're looking, from visits to DME to diagnostic tests to prescription drugs, uh, there is substantial underutilization for those high value services that I put in the category of the ones uh, I beg my patients to do. And this has been the crux of getting away from this one-size-fits-all type of discussion to that of uh, how much to how well. Next slide, please. So um, some of the big issues and the things that make the headlines tend to be uh, what things cost, whether it be diagnostics like proton beam therapy, certain very uh, expensive and invasive uh, procedures as well as especially pharmaceuticals, but um, for today, I'd like us to focus on not what things cost in terms of average wholesale price or charges or what health plans are paying, but what actually is paid by the consumer, given that that has been uh, our focus for a very, very long time. And ideally, consumer cost sharing levels would be set to encourage the clinically appropriate use of healthcare services. And it's been our view now for going on two decades that the current one-size-fits-all cost sharing tends to acknowledge the differences and why differences in clinical value among medical interventions, that all doctor visits should not cost the same, all diagnostic tests should not cost the same, and certainly, in my opinion, not all pharmaceuticals should cost the same in the tier of the formulary, and this particularly raises issues in specialty pharmaceuticals. Many of you have probably seen some version of the Kaiser Family Foundation survey of employer health benefits uh, just out a week or so ago, uh, as you see on the right side of this slide, acknowledging what I think all of us know, no matter where we're coming from, provider, payer, or patient, uh, that consumer cost sharing is rising, and predictions of consumer cost sharing rising across the board uh, are quite severe as we finish this decade and go into the next. Next slide, please. So. Um, Regarding consumer cost sharing, you know, I can't believe you had to spend a million dollars to show that if you make people pay more for something, they'll buy less of it. A quote from one of the great health services researchers, my mother, 
uh, as Mike Chernew and I embarked on a research agenda now over 15 years old looking at the impact of consumer cost sharing on medical behaviors. And uh, as you look to the next slide, you'll see, as is the case for all of you on the phone, uh, your mother tends to be right. Uh, in the upper left, you see a recent Gallup poll stating that 30% of Americans are putting off medical treatment uh, because of cost. And as uh, we at the VBID Center and several academics, including uh, Dr. Schrank on the phone, have been producing or synthesizing a large body of evidence suggesting that as we have made Americans pay more for non-essential and essential care, they have stopped purchasing both. Not only have these essential care utilizations go down uh, as cost sharing goes up, this evidence has been shown to worsen socioeconomic disparities in health care. And in some situations, the foregoing of high-value services early in the course of the disease has led to greater overall costs, which is why we were so thrilled to see just over a year ago a major editorial in the New York Times, as you see on the right side of this slide, bringing attention to the fact that cost sharing may in fact may be too blunt an instrument and may be getting in the way of what we're trying to do regarding the mission of our healthcare system as driven by the triple aim. Next slide, please. So uh, the approach we'd like to get away from one size fits all to one of clinical nuance that brings direct attention to the fact that medical services differ in the clinical benefit produced, that some uh, prescription drugs are more valuable than others within a tier of the formulary, including specialty, some diagnostic tests as well as some doctor visits, and uh, which will come germane later on in our discussion that the clinical benefits from a specific service depends on who gets it, who provides it, and where. And I think we should have a robust dialogue on what the role of incorporating clinical nuance in a benefit design might be as we look more carefully uh, and rigorously at the evidence around specialty pharmaceuticals. Next slide, please. The way we have implemented clinical nuance in a benefit design, uh, you know, we call it value-based insurance design. Um, you could find, you know, lots of public and private payers across the country who have put VBID programs in place. Uh, the basic premise of value-based insurance design is to set consumer cost sharing on the clinical benefit, importantly, not the acquisition price of the service. And the fact that we would very much like to see a reduction or in some cases elimination of financial barriers to high-value clinical services and those high-performing providers. Next slide. So um, many of you on the line have either heard myself or Dr. Chernu talking about uh, value-based insurance design even before we coined the term in 2004. Uh, most VBID programs around the country have focused on removing financial barriers for drugs to treat chronic conditions such as diabetes, asthma, and heart disease. There have been a number of important systematic reviews of the literature of these VBID CARAT programs. Uh, the one on the right side, you'll see the third author, Dr. Schrank and his team then at Harvard, uh, many of them transitioning to CVS Health. Uh, this evidence review is uh, quite straightforward in the fact that making people pay less for something, they'll buy more of it. It's typically a modest increase in adherence between 3 and 15 percent. Importantly, those who uh, enroll in VBID programs see lower consumer out-of-pocket costs, which should not be underestimated in terms of the positivity of embarking in a program that's giving consumers something back as opposed to taking away, which has been the primary lever for the last decade. Most of our VBID programs in chronic diseases have shown to have no significant increase in total spending. Some save a little bit, some save a lot. Uh, this is not the answer to the healthcare cost curve, but it's, I like to say it's first class for the price of coach in the fact that you're getting more health for the money you're spending. And I'll leave Will to talk about his very important study about how uh, cost sharing reductions tend to be most impactful for those who uh, tend to be socioeconomically vulnerable. Next slide. Uh, very quickly, all of this information available on our website, uh, value-based insurance design is one of the few healthcare reform ideas with uh, very broad multi-stakeholder support as well as bipartisan political support both at the federal as well as state levels. Next slide. Value-based insurance design, most importantly, has to Section 2713 of the Affordable Care Act, which made a major stride forward to put clinically nuanced cost-sharing elimination for now greater than 
60 evidence-based preventive services in a nuanced way. And uh, you can see that uh, HHS has recently reported that over 100 million Americans have received expanded coverage, uh, leading to greater access. But importantly, even when these services are free, uh, people still don't get them all the time. They get them more often, but not all the time. Uh, next slide, please. So value-based insurance design, although most of the data are in these small molecule drugs or high-value drugs for chronic conditions, we have seen VBID through the ACA, through prevention and screening. We have seen a number of private and public payers put cost-sharing reductions for certain diagnostic tests or monitoring tests like a hemoglobin A1C or an LDL cholesterol for uh, hyperlipidemia, certain high-value treatments, clinician visits. VBID is now increasingly being used uh, to steer patients to high-performing physician networks, as well as uh, other aspects of the healthcare uh, delivery spectrum. So uh, obviously this webinar is the potential role for value-based insurance design in specialty pharmaceuticals. Uh, we have been very excited about our work in this area, and you can see on the next slide we have partnered with NPC to put out uh, this June at the Institute of Medicine uh, meeting on high-value cancer care and approach to applying value-based insurance design to specialty pharmaceuticals. Uh, this is a fairly detailed document but, but does come with a short summary. Uh, there are a number of ways that you could put VBIT in place. Some states have gone so far to put a limit on the amount of cost sharing that you could put on all especially pharmaceuticals or just high-value services. Uh, we tend to like uh, a nuanced type of reduction in accordance to specific patient or disease-specific characteristics. There is an interesting idea being floated about, and I look forward to uh, hearing the other panelists' view on putting cost-sharing in place for high-cost interventions only when certain consumers have been asked to take advantage of perhaps lower cost and less effective type of techniques. We call that reward the good soldier. And then, as I mentioned, uh, the last thing I'll say before I turn it over to Will is not only can we use VBID to identify particular high-value services, as you can within a pharmaceutical benefit manager, you could also identify the venue of care, whether it be a high-performing uh, physician's office, a network, an ACO, or even the site to get your prescriptions filled. Uh, so with that, I'm, I'm uh, thrilled to uh, turn this over to my friend and colleague, Will Schrank. Well, thank you, Mark. I, um, I appreciate the, the kind words, but I got to say, it's, uh, it's kind of a lousy job to have to follow up Mark after Mark Fendrick as he's talking about value-based insurance design. I don't know if the right response is to say what he said or ditto or something like that, but I will nonetheless continue to try to uh, try to come up with a, a unique line of thinking. Uh, but Mark has has for sure been such a great leader and as a researcher, as a innovator, and as an advocate around this topic. So um, his perspective is uniquely insightful, and I'm always grateful to hear it. So um, I, I wanted to speak a little bit to the sort of what, what's different about specialty value-based insurance design as compared to value-based insurance design that we often apply for medications like diabetes or hypertension or hypercholesterolemia. Really, the thing that's different here is this, this is the cost of the medicine. Right, the calculus should be unchanged. The notion that if something is a really, really great value, if a medication is really offers an extraordinary value, and non-adherence would adversely affect the the value produced, that creating barriers to the use of something that offers great value and for whom adherence is essential. Um, the, the rationale is quite the same as when you're talking about metformin or when you're talking about a, uh, in diabetes or you're talking about a, an ACE inhibitor or a, you know, a beta blocker after a heart, heart attack. 
Um, so in a lot of ways, we're not. This is not a re. This is not a re. This is less of a of a revolution and more of a a modest evolution. I think from what we had been looking at, a standard value-based insurance design, to now this notion of a specialty value-based insurance design. If you go to the next slide, you know we're learning a lot about about value-based insurance designs. It's not as though it's just you know there's just a couple different flavors. You either give away the drug for free, you know, you pull back a little bit on the cost of some of the drugs. There's, there's now a bunch of features to value-based insurance uh, design plans that can be utilized to better engage, promote um, health, and and try to make sure patients are taking the appropriate meds and 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 really changing their behavior. Um, we did a study where we looked at 76 different value-based insurance pl design plans within Caremark. So Caremark has well over 100 different plan designs. And we looked at 76 of them, and we characterized them each in terms of the generosity, the, the use of tiers, what, you know, how they target high-risk patients, whether they have wellness programs, disease management programs, uh, whether it's male only versus male retail. And we looked at it for a, uh, several different classes of medications and found really some important trends, some important learnings across um, these, these 76 plans that help us think about how to, how to structure, how to design value-based insurance design plans um, even better moving forward. In particular, uh, the more generous plans seem to do better in terms of promoting um, better adherence. Um, when, when, when plans target higher risk patients, more effective. Um, when plans coexist with wellness programs, more effective. We saw some confusing results when plans coexist with with disease management programs. We think it's largely because they're sort of competing with each other, um, and mail only seem to perform better than mail and retail. Not entirely sure why. But the idea here is that we are moving towards a more evidence-based way of designing and implementing value-based insurance design plans that will have a real meaningful impact on how patients use their meds and manage their chronic diseases. If you go to the next slide, you know we, we're really interested in understanding whether or not um, these kinds of designs differentially affect some subgroups more than others. And we have a deep commitment to understanding ways that we can reduce disparities in care. So there's a study called the MI Free Trial, where we randomized patients who were insured by Aetna and had their first heart attack to one of two arms, either to get all their medications for free, value-based insurance design through Aetna, or to pay usual care copays. And the results, which are not presented here, um, showed a modest improvement in adherence in those who got their drugs for free, about a 5% improvement in adherence. We saw about 11% reduction in subsequent vascular events, which is a you know certainly a compelling response. And we found non-statistically significant trend of cost savings for Aetna. And um, when we published it in the New England Journal, it was we were required to publish it as a budget-neutral study. But it raises the question of whether or not these kinds of designs influence people differently. And we know that non-whites um, have greater problems with adherence than whites. And we've done a systematic review, and others have looked at this as well. It's pretty consistent. Uh, we're not exactly sure why, the extent to which it's driven by socioeconomic versus cultural factors. But there are important disparities in how patients adhere to essential chronic medication therapy. And what's so interesting is when we, re -look, when we, when we took another look at the value-based insurance design data from the MI free trial, and we, um, we looked at two subgroups, the, uh, a white and a non-white subgroup, all the benefit all the benefit came in the non-white group. 
we saw a substantial reduction in, um, in the rate of subsequent vascular events. Uh, and similarly, we saw a meaningful reduction in total cost of care um, in those non-white patients that received their medications for free. So it really speaks to the fact that value-based insurance design not only you know, is helping us move, move the needle in the right direction uh, to reduce costs, improve quality, but also helps us to do so by reducing disparities in care, something very appealing. So how do we think about it in terms of specialty? If you go to the next slide, we wrote this, my, um, my current boss, Troy Brennan, and I wrote a paper in JAMA a couple weeks, uh, maybe a month ago looking at um, really kind of talking through the challenges around Sovaldi, these new specialty meds that are ex very expensive treatments for hep C, and how complicated it is to wrap our heads around how to manage their use. What's great about Sovaldi is it's extraordinarily effective. It's the best drug that we've had, that's been made for this condition. and with cure rates on the order of 95% and relatively little discontinuation rates because the meds are very well tolerated. The thing that's extraordinarily challenging is that the medication costs over $100,000 for a regimen, a 12-week regimen. Over a th or approximately $1,000 a pill. And um, when you think about the number of people eligible for hep C treatment, the outlays to pay for these drugs is quite extraordinary. And we find ourselves in this position of saying, well, we've got a good treatment. We, uh, it's, it's, it's the right thing for a lot of people, but it's so expensive um, that, that if, we, um, if we use it for everybody that's eligible, it bankrupts the healthcare system, or nearly bankrupts the health. It has a huge impact on the healthcare budgets. So on the other hand, if you make these medications expensive to the patient, and they start their medication, and then take you know a month of it, they take $30,000 worth of their medication, decide they can't afford the second set, um, and they don't refill their medications, that's a, that is a true waste you know, non-adherence to a Medicaid, to a Silvaldi reg regimen in patients for whom the medication is appropriate is the greatest waste. You, you waste very expensive medication, there is a cost incurred, and there is no benefit. And this is where we sort of need to wrap our heads around. We, how do we really identify, how do we really qualify value when these medications are so expensive? How do we think about the downstream costs that need to be averted in order to be able to feel comfortable reducing uh, barriers to and improving access to um, to these very expensive meds. And ultimately, you know, we're we can't today just make it simple and easy for everybody with who's a carrier for Hep C to to take Sovaldi because that would lead to massive, massive changes in the premiums of all Americans. So here we're finding ourselves in this really, really unique and, and sort of um, challenging scenario where it's not about the quality or the value of the drug, it's more about sort of the, the, the population effects of, an, of, of, the, the, of, the, of the very expensive drug. And it's here that we find these value-based insurance design um, questions to really resonate. We do not want to create barriers that, that lead to great waste of, of Sovaldi and where patients are taking some but not completing their therapy and wasting extraordinary costs in therapy. However, we have to be pretty thoughtful about who gets it in the first place, making really, really um, clear expectations around for whom these medications are available and appropriate. And by building a system like that, we think we can get to a value-based insurance design approach that leads to better health, lower total costs, and a rational use of the medications as needed. I'll pass it on.
Thanks, Will. So now we'll turn it over to Dr. Brian Klepper from the National Business Coalition on Health. Brian? Good afternoon. Um, following both Will and Mark is, uh, is, a, is a daunting challenge, I agree, but let's see what we can do. Mm -hmm. um, I, I represent the, the purchaser perspective on this, and, and um, in thinking about what I wanted to say on this, on this webinar, uh, as someone who has done a lot of healthcare purchasing, um, I think that I wanted to expand the, expand the number of questions that are asked. The way, first let me say that, that the, the conclusion that uh, both Dr. Fendrick and Dr. Schrank have, have uh, have expressed are are undeniable and and absolutely right. Um, it is it is if we can go to the next slide. It, it is very counterproductive to to create such an onerous uh, financial burden for the patient that they can't stand to stay in the game. Uh, at the same time, the way that the question is framed puts the onus only on the, in, in this case, only on the employer. Uh, and it says, if you don't pick, pick up all of this cost or most of this cost for this, for this um, patient, their, their uh, inability to hang in, in there is really at your feet. And that is, that's not exactly right. Um, it is to a degree, um, but I'm, and I'm not somebody who uh, is a big believer in more skin in the game or, or any of that. I, I, I think that these are wonderful new solutions that generally haven't been there before. We need to find ways to make them right. But the full definition of value has to be that they're priced right as well as, as, well as from, the, from the manufacturer's side. And so that, what that calls for is equal scrutiny not only of the dynamics of for patients and purchasers, but also everybody else who's involved in the in the equation. Next slide, please. I, I think that what I'm getting at is that the approaches that we take, uh, to borrow from Dr. Fender, need to be financially nuanced as well as as clinically nuanced. And there are a lot of questions here. So, for example. Um, why do we need to take the current pricing structure of any particular drug for granted? Um, Joe Nocera wrote an article in the New York Times in July about a new drug for um, cystic fibrosis that will be $300,000 a year for life for the patients to take them. Um, there, is a, there is an entirely new set of drugs that fall into this category and the pricing for each one of them is immense, so much so that in Dr. Fendrick's uh, article that, that, that I went through, he points out that, uh, his team points out that we're likely to be spending half of all of our money on special, uh, for, for, for drug spend, half of all of our drug spend will go to specialty drugs in four years from now. Um, in that kind of environment, we're looking at such a massive change and such a massive um, lift that it is um, it would be foolhardy to take all this for granted and not not begin to ask deeper questions and the deeper questions might be might include things like what are the actual development costs here and 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 what is the pricing in other countries for the same thing and and what what care costs does this particular drug displace uh, and what are the contributions to total profitability? And and if this is in fact such a wonderful thing, are the are the manufacturers willing to go at risk for their performance in the same way that my that the company that I came from goes at risk for its performance? Um, these are uh, these are important questions, and they need to be asked. And I realize that this is not this was not the the content that um, was that this this webinar was about about per se but it doesn't seem to me to be reasonable to have a discussion about such an important topic and leave these things off the questions we have to ask about 
the supply side as well as, as, well as the demand side. Uh, next, next slide, please. It's, it's equally important, may, maybe not quite as equally important, but nearly, to ask other, other questions about how the, how the process has been managed. You know, is the, has a step therapy process been put into place? Uh, was the drug appropriate in the first case? And, and is it likely to be, to be affected in this particular patient's case as, as so many of the specialty drugs are, are, are highly personalized? Um, is, is the drug being delivered in the most efficient site? And these are all very important issues. Um, if you're, uh, particularly if you're on the purchasing side and you're, and you're, you're actually trying to optimize the, the total results that, that you're after. Next slide, please. Um, if we don't take this approach, then certain things will almost certainly happen. Um, one of the big impacts of, un, uh, of, of, the, of unbridled uh, medical inflation, premium inflation, you can look in the, in the, in the Kaiser Family Foundation benefits uh, report that, that Mark uh, referred to and see that you know, healthcare inflation has run four and a half times as fast as everything else in the economy for more than 14 years. And that's one of the reasons why we're why we're in such a precarious position. So where does it you know one of the problems that healthcare has generally is that it now consumes four dollars out of every five dollars basically in in the growth of the economy. It, it, that's been stated in a number of different ways: household income growth and and and, and the the assumption of wages, wage growth, and so on. But basically, it's the growth of the whole economy. Ultimately, it leads to, to economic instability if we get to a point where, we, where we're funneling so much money into healthcare that we don't have enough money for other critical needs like education and infrastructure replenishment. And ultimately, if we get to a point where we have, we have wholesale, uh, uh, a wholesale um, effort to get to get our thing funded, um, that'll ultimately lead to pricing regulation, which would be which would be absolutely the um, the thing that, that that pharma would be most opposed to. And and the flip side of that is that is that if we get to a point as we have with general healthcare costs, where employers go, I just can't handle that this much more money. Um, what they've done to respond, and you can see these numbers very clearly, is, is, that, is that the rate of uptake of, of commercial coverage uh, among potential enrollees has declined year over year. Um, so now there are, you know, many, many children have fallen off of health plans and so on. That will happen here as well. Um, so none of these are good outcomes, and we have to try to figure out the, the big challenge is to figure out how to unwind this particular problem and its massive, massive cost with agreed much better outcomes to, to try to get at a, at a more nuanced understanding of what value really is. Next slide, please. So what will it take? Um, uh, by, by chance, I got a call yesterday or the day before uh, that that uh, the National Coalition on Healthcare has decided to undertake uh, an effort to really begin to look at the at, at the overall costs of specialty drugs. Um, when groups like that begin to take notice and begin to say this is a this is a major area of impact, then we need to come together. Ultimately, what it'll take though is collaborative action on the purchaser side to pay attention to these deeper issues, the hard data that, that people like Dr. Fendrick and Dr. Schrank have, have brought to the table and begin applying this to get a much more nuanced, nuanced uh, understanding of what value really is. It is not that we should not be interested in, in, uh, in paying these prices for these much better drugs. It is that we should, we should start paying attention and questioning whether those things are uh, are priced correctly and reasonably, uh, or whether we're simply um, uh, following, we're simply taking everything for granted. 
And I think that that context is what's so important. I think that's everything that I know. Well, thank you, Brian. I promised to ask us some hard questions, and you did, which we appreciate. Um, Mark, I'm, I'm sure you have some thoughts on some of the points that Brian made, uh, especially some of the points that were related to managing the process, which feed into some of the points from our VBID paper and the reward the good soldier comment that you mentioned earlier. Would you like to react to some of those points? Sure. Thanks, Kimberly and, and, and Will and Brian. Uh, terrific um, webinar thus far. I, I think I'm just going to try to uh, respond briefly to the, the fact that Americans are being asked to pay more for their health care. That is the one thing that's irrefutable. And uh, as many people know, I want people to pay more for health care for the care that doesn't make them any healthier. And um, I think Brian and I surprisingly overlap on the, on the three main points he made, and particularly as they pertain to specialty. So one is this idea of uh, nuance and nuance benefit design. I, I am not at all ever going to engage on where a company sets a price and looking into those issues, Brian, as you know. So um, this idea that we should reduce cost sharing in accordance to patient and disease-specific characteristics is, is pure VBID. And uh, as we continue to develop, say, companion diagnostics or other markers, uh, I would love to see more uh, payers, like the will think about that, of actually making cost sharing differential on uh, the higher likelihood that an agent actually is uh, likely to be effective. The second is this issue of step therapy, which uh, I have written many times, as you know, uh, both Will and Brian, and that I support step therapy, but also understand that in many areas that um, lower cost, often small molecules don't work well. Um, specialty is, I'm not an oncologist or rheumatologist, but I do know, for instance, a good example used is um, what to do in rheumatoid arthritis with lower cost non-biologics compared to biologics. And my best read of the literature suggests that about one in three or maybe slightly less of these patients with a very serious disease will do well on a lower cost uh, non-biologic agent. I do strongly believe that if a patient were to take that lower cost agent, whether it be one or two, and they are deemed by their clinician to need a more expensive agent, they should actually get a uh, co-payment relief uh, for doing what they were supposed to do, particularly if that lower cost agent didn't work. And we call that, as Kimberly said, reward the good soldier. And we have a, a number of payers who are now considering putting this in place for some of the chronic diseases that Will and I have studied as well as in specialty. And the last, very quickly, Brian, as you point out, you know I'm a strong supporter and worked with uh, a majority of your coalitions, not only on using BBID for services, but also using cost sharing to encourage patients to select high-performing providers and settings. And uh, we've already seen some great movement afoot and some early empirical evidence to suggest that you know, if you could get the same service at a, you know, at, at a center that provides it at one third the cost, and certainly, we would like to think that um, health plans and then pharmaceutical benefit managers should allow and actually encourage individuals to go that route. Thank you, Mark. Um, one question that has come in, which I think you can answer for us, is whether or not there are federal rules that impede the exchange plans from employing VBID? Uh, thanks for that. That's a, I'm looking at the clock and want to make so the, the answer is, um, I'll try to pivot a little bit on this. In the commercial marketplace, the biggest barrier we have in place to implement value-based insurance design is in HSA qualified, health savings accounts qualified high deductible health plans which an interpretation of an IRS guidance makes it very difficult uh, to put nuanced designs in people with um, diagnosed clinical conditions like many that are used uh, in specialty pharmaceuticals. As far as I know, there are a number of states who have actually embraced VBID not only in their legislation but also in their taxonomy. So I don't think it, it pertains to exchanges per se, Kimberly. I think it's more of the type of plan. And then on the commercial side, it's HSA qualified HDHPs that make it most difficult. We do have um, a new CMS rule allowing VBID in Medicaid, 
and some very interesting bipartisan work uh, going on simultaneously, some work at CMMI, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which Will knows well, to actually move VBID forward in Medicare Advantage plans. Great, thanks. Uh, a question that's come in for, for Will. Given CVS's experience with implementing VBID, what plan characteristics do you see as being the most impactful in improving adherence to specialty medications and ultimately to those patient outcomes that we're all seeking? Well, our data would suggest that, um, that the more generous plans and plans that don't tier uh, plans essentially that make it easier to get the you know the 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 more easy it is to to the fewer barriers to get these drugs the more they're used. I think that there's a really interesting story about the intersection or interaction between wellness programs and um, and VBED, and that in settings where we're trying to really encourage patients to not to smoke to do the sort of the right preventive behaviors, uh, we see an incremental improvement in adherence. And it really speaks to the fact that maybe there is a way for us to kind of engage patients in healthier behaviors that extend beyond just taking their meds, but that include going to the gym, that include, um, you know, uh, however it is that they're going to improve their diet. and and wear a Fitbit, um, and that those things may sort of have a, a, a synergistic reaction. So I think that was a story that we found really interesting and compelling and something that we really want to pursue further. Great. Well, Thank you, Will. Well, let Go me ahead. comment on that. The, the, best, the best study that I've seen on that comes from uh, Jerry Reeves, Dr. Jerry Reeves, working with a group in, uh, in uh, Vegas, which tied very strong carrots and very strong sticks to those kinds of things within a health plan, but not, not in terms of putting just financial risk on the patient, but in, in terms of encouraging them to do the things that we know work. And it turns out that in that structure, he was able to encourage patients to do a lot of those positive things uh, overall costs dropped by 23%. Uh, oh. hospital, dead, dead, hospital days dropped by almost half. Advanced images dropped by almost a third with better outcomes. Um, so, so I think you're on the right path. Oh, thanks. Um, Brian, a question we have for you. Uh, about a month or so ago, NBCH put out an issue brief on uh, value-based purchasing and we'd be interested in knowing what sort of evidence would be helpful to employers who are designing or thinking about implementing such a plan. Who, who are thinking about implementing um, a VBID plan? Yes. Well, I, I mean, I, we're big believers in VBID, and um, and I, I believe that you know all the research anyone could want is on is on. Uh, uh, Dr. Fendrick's website, um, but I think that the the larger principle here is is engaging with behaviors and with with vendors that have um, you know strong data associated with showing that they produce better health health outcomes at lower cost. Do, really doing what works, and um, at NBCH we are in the beginning. We'll start next week rolling out first the PDM and then a musculoskeletal management um, uh, function and cardiometabolic management function from organizations that are coming in at, at 30, 40 percent below the cost of other, of other more conventional treatments in the system with, with quantifiably better health outcomes. I think that what this goes to is no magic, but the fact that there is so much excess in the current system um, because, because of a lot of the structural flaws that we have, the subjugation of primary care, the lack of, lack of transparency, fee-for-service, and so on. So there are organizations in the country that are really doing this in a better way. 
I think that that the the place where academic research and field research field um, experience come together is is in discussions like this, where what we are, what we have experienced firsthand is very very um, aligned with the kind of with the kind of principles that VBID stands for. So, so I mean, I would encourage anyone who is interested in this at all to check in with Dr. Fendrick and and, and check in with me, and we'll we, we'll be glad to discuss it in more depth. And a follow-on question just came in for you, Brian, uh, about whether there's other data that employers should consider when they're thinking about value, um, how helpful absenteeism and presenteeism data are to employers? Well, I think that, I think that absentee and presenteeism data are, are hugely important. I don't think that there are, in the, for most employers, they're not, they don't have a good way to track that yet in any meaningful way. I know that in the, in the clinic and medical management company that I come, come from, very few of our clients, um, you know, who were not jumbo clients, were able to track track that with any granularity. I think that the place to start is is not with absentee and presenteeism data, but with hard claims data for med surge and and uh, RX as well as other things like like biometrics and HRAs and so on. Um, so I think that there's a lot of information out there. Um, it's a, it's a very very big topic. People like Bruce Sherman are, are experts on this as well, uh, from who's who's aligned with Employers Health and and Walmart. Um, so so I guess we need to get into a more a more specific discussion to really nail that down. Um, you know, feel free to get in touch and we can have a more a more in depth discussion. Absolutely, we look forward to that discussion. Um, Mark, another question has come in for you. Um, oh, and you know, a, a thought that I just had before I move on to the other question is um, some work that NPC has done uh, with with Dr. Fendrick actually touches on that presenteeism and absenteeism uh, question, and we have that paper available on the NPC website along with our um, published work on the VBID and specialty design, we have a paper called Synergies at Work, which does get into looking at the fuller value of health and including some of the uh, thoughts such as producti produ productivity, absenteeism, presenteeism. Um, so I, I almost missed the opportunity to mention that work that we have available for you. Um, another question now that did come in for, for Dr. Fendrick is how VBID ties to uh, payment reform initiatives that may currently be underway. Thanks, Kimberly. And I see we're getting close on time. I want to thank the uh, well over 100 people are still on the line for listening up. And again, uh, as Brian and Will suggested, you know, visit our website, send us messages if you have questions or concerns. I think the last point I wanted to make, which is why I was told by the U.S. Congress as the guy who's done the slow, done the most to slow the adoption of his own idea is that uh, value-based insurance design is one of um, many levers, and I believe it's a small lever in the healthcare transformation areas that things that are on Brian's plate and Will's plate, you know, benefit design, copay changes, even clinical nuances, is an important red, but we're not the red, you know, we make the red redder. And um, the big levers that are happening are these provider-facing initiatives that Brian alluded to as we move from, you know, from an iterative sense, from volume to value, leaving fee for service to uh, new innovative payment models. And I think the most important thing that I tell employers, whether they be jumbo or two employees, is that first embrace this movement away from fee for service in terms of provider facing initiatives. And second, if you're going to incent your providers to do things based on the value of care and health production, please, please, please align your benefit design to make sure that those patients can do the things that the doctors and the nurses and the physician assistants are being incented to do. So whether it be, you know, my patients who I'm paid to get a 
bonus if my patients get diabetic eyes examined and my patients in high deductible plans can't afford to get their diabetic eyes examined. I am encouraged to have my patients incurred uh, certain pathways of care for chronic diseases that we have a lot of experience in, Will and I, as well as some more expensive, uh, less studied conditions like certain cancers and, and uh, autoimmune diseases and rheumatologic disorders. So if you are going to benchmark us to do certain things to produce quality, think about aligning your value-based design to make sure that those patients will not have a barrier and make it actually easy for them to do the things that you're actually incenting your providers to do so. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. And with that, we are uh, at the top of the hour and out of time today. Thank you so much, Dr. Fendrick, Dr. Schrank, Dr. Klepper, for joining us for this important conversation. Clearly, we have many other conversations ahead of us as we begin to tackle this tough road. Um, today we talked about ensuring patient access to needed specialty medications and how value-based insurance design can be one tool in that important quest. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having us.